that's just uh, that's just faith. You don't even know, know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, we're delighted to have you here. It's a very special night because we have a very close friend of President Ford speak to you tonight, and he brought along his lovely wife, Kay. Kay, why don't you stand up and be recognized? Uh, it's not that often we get the wife of the speaker, so we have her. As I have said so many times, and don't feel badly about being redund redundant about this, the relationship between the Gerald R. Ford Foundation and the uh, Grand Valley State College is a marvelous relationship. We've got some of our trustees that are here from the foundation, and the interesting thing about the trustees that are here is they also have been very generous in so many ways to Grand Valley State University. And I'll start back there with Ambassador Secchia, who's been a charter member of the Gerald R. Ford Foundation and very, we were, had dinner last night, tonight right across the street from Secchia Hall, so you know he's very supportive. Uh, Seymour, where are you? There's Seymour Padnos. He doesn't like to be introduced. He's very shy. And, uh, <laughs> but also very generous. Um, John Babb is our treasurer of the foundation. John is sitting right over here. Um, Peter Cook, he's got the really the better title. He's, he's a trustee emeritus. Those are the great jobs. <laughs> and his buddy over here, Ralph Hollenstein, is also a trustee emeritus. And so they're very special. Both of them kind of young for the job, but, um, but they're doing all right. Bob Hooker, where's Bob? Oh, there you are, Bob. Bob's been a, has been a great asset to the foundation, and as you probably know, has been very supportive of Grand Valley State University. So it's been a great relationship. Um, I always the suit I think permanently has the, my card in it. Uh, I always put my pitch in now that if you're not a member of the Gerald R. Ford. Friends of Ford, there's no time like present to do that. Uh, we need your support to be able to do these kind of programs. I'll exempt the students back there. You're, you're here free. You don't have to worry about this. <laughs> Someday we'll get you. We won't get you right now. So uh, without further ado, uh, I want to introduce Glees Whitney, who uh, has really made the Allenstein Center for Presidential Studies such a success and selfishly has done so much for the Gerald R. Ford Foundation since he's been here. And I just caught a glimpse down here. I can't go on without introducing Don Lovers. Don started this relationship uh, with me several years ago and it's built from there. So Don, we're very thankful to you. But at this time, please, why don't you step forward here. Thank you very much, Marty, for the kind comments. And I uh, certainly want to second everything Marty just said about the excellent working relationship that Grand Valley and the Howenstein Center enjoys with uh, the Ford Museum, the Ford Foundation. It is truly a treasure here in West Michigan and uh, a great privilege to work with you. Thank you. Well, welcome to our fourth event in the 1,000-day lecture series uh, here at the Ford Museum and uh, Howenstein Center event. Uh, this 1,000-day uh, lecture series seeks to bring speakers who have special insights into the administration of Gerald R. Ford. His administration lasted about 1,000 days. And uh, we hope that you'll continue to uh, come and enjoy these talks because we always have very interesting speakers, and tonight is no exception. We have uh, Tom Reed with us. Tom Reed, I learned at dinner, has worked with every president since Dwight Eisenhower. He is a former Secretary of the Air Force, a special assistant to President Reagan for national security policy, and a consultant at Lawrence Livermore, where much of the country's nuclear weapons research takes place. Tom Reed graduated first in his class from Cornell University. He went to work at Lawrence Livermore, where he designed two thermonuclear devices that were exploded in the Pacific in 1962. How many people do you get to meet with that background? 
On leaving Livermore, he started a successful high-tech company that made superconductors. And as if he were not busy enough, in 1966, he became interested in a California gubernatorial candidate whose name was Ronald Reagan. Tom Reed uh, helped lead that successful campaign in 1966, served with Governor Reagan, and went on in 1970 to lead the uh, second, uh, the re-election campaign for Governor Reagan, and was also successful, as you know. In 1973, Reagan was, uh, Reed, excuse me, was recruited to manage intelligence projects at the Pentagon. He rose to Secretary of the Air Force under President Ford. Now permit me to read a passage from Secretary Reed's new book about his first meeting with President Ford in the Oval Office. It's a very human look at what it's like to go through this experience. Tom Reed's words. My chance to lobby the most important Michigander of all came on a summer evening in July 1975. Gerald Ford had been president less than a year. We knew each other from earlier days, and he knew of my track record as a political manager. He wanted to talk. Now, you may be important, you may think you're cool, but everyone's first visit to the Oval Office is a fright. The majesty of the White House itself is overwhelming. Entry through the gates and guards, passing the Marine at the entry to the West Wing, walking down the narrow hallways, cramped for space but reeking with power, and standing in the President's outer office, all burn themselves into your memory. They leave the visitor inarticulate, barely able to hear the soothing sounds from the President's secretary. And then those fateful words, the President will see you now, 7 o'clock on the hot summer evening of July 17th, 1975, was that moment for me. I was going to meet with the President, President Ford, alone in the Oval Office to discuss his political future." Close quote. Gives you a little bit of an insight of uh, Secretary Reed's experience. Well, Tom Reed later served President Reagan. He was a special assistant for national security policy with him. And his principal contribution and a huge one it was, was to come up with the national security policy that was used as the roadmap for winning the Cold War without firing a nuclear shot. Well, history has certainly vindicated your work, sir. Tom Reed left Washington in 1983, but continued to advise presidents on national security issues and still does today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm Michigan welcome to Secretary Tom Reed. This is really, uh, I just can't tell you how much fun it is to be here, that uh, Marty Allen has been a great and good friend in, in uh, arranging uh, a date for me to come here. Uh, that Gleaves has uh, been a great host. Bob Gamble has uh, smoothed all the comings and goings. But I just want to compliment you, all of you that have in any way connected with the foundation, the museum, the library. I have seen enough presidents and I have seen their libraries. But this place is really very unique. Most presidential libraries get caught up in all the internecine warfare that goes on in the White House and they get carried on to, to the libraries until the president and his widow and the family are all dead and gone. And then you can finally get down to serious academics. This place has been run right from the very beginning. And that uh, Marty and Gleaves and Bob and all of you connected with these facilities, uh, that is no, no mean job. And Hardy's congratulations for doing that. And thank you so for having me. It's really a great place. Uh, I wrote a book, as, as uh, Gleaves told you. It's about the Cold War. I did not intend to write a book. I did not envision myself as the great dramatist or novelist of the 20th century or the 21st. Uh, I just worked at the White House and I worked at the Pentagon and a lot of interesting things happened. Now, you must understand right from the beginning that despite all those uh, kind words, uh, 
once you work at the White House for a week, once you've gone through this ghastly experience of being initiated into the Oval Office, working at the White House is just like another day at the insurance company. <laughs> you get there in the morning and the coffee isn't made, so you have to deal with that. And then your inbox is full of all this paper because the situation room comes to work an hour or two before you do, and there's all these memos from about terrible problems and terrible places you can't even pronounce. Uh, and while you're reading through all this bad news, uh, then somebody rushes in and says your boss wants something done in the next 15 minutes, and please come meet with him. And since he's a president, why well, probably you ought to do that. And you get through with that, and then some guy with an inflated ego comes in and wastes hours of your time telling you all about his problems, which you happen to think are insignificant. And finally, it's 5 o'clock, and you say, I just can't stand this anymore, and I'm going to go home to my dear wife and family, and I'll try again tomorrow. And that's it. And that's the way it is. And those Marines at the gates do not blow a trumpet when you come to work and say, ta-da, today you're going to make history. It's just another day. Now, I know that's hard to believe, but that's the way it was, and therefore, I left the White House. I worked there for a couple of historic years. I had known Ronald Reagan for 17 years. We were very close associates. Uh, but when my job was done, I went home. And it wasn't until I started reading books about the Cold War that I began to understand these guys, these authors, don't know what they're talking about. I was there. Uh, they're not being misleading. They just don't know. Uh, that some books talked glowingly about the paper that I had written about the plan to end the Cold War. I really thought it was just another piece of paper. Uh, you know, I, I met with the president every morning at 9. Uh, one morning he peered over his glasses and said, uh, uh, it was after I'd been there two weeks, Tom, we got this problem we got to deal with. And the tone of voice was, the air conditioner doesn't work, or something like that. The problem is the Soviet Union. <laughs> And, and his views were, we need to think through what we're going to do about ending this Cold War and winning it. Um, I uh, say I read these books. The crowning blow was uh, I gave a talk in the local high school. A bunch of junior high kids, two kids, stuck their hands in the air simultaneously and said, Mr. Reed, uh, tell us about Vietnam. Our grandfathers flew there. Hmm. Huh. That kind of brought it home. Time is going by. And so I put to work, got to work writing down and looking into some of the things that I had been fortunate enough to just be at the right place at the right time. The conclusions that I came up with, the, the real surprising things were twofold. One is the world, certainly the world of Cold War historians, is full of people with very clear memories of Cold War events that simply never happened. And secondly, I came away with an enormous respect for my counterparts in the Soviet Union because the, the Red Army is a tough outfit. They are not Boy Scouts. They are tough. But when it came to nuclear weapons, the Red Army did what was right. They had the greatest of integrity. Some examples. We all think we know what happened to Joseph Stalin because TASS, Soviet news agency, told us. He died of a stroke in the Kremlin March 5th, 1953, period, end of story. That is utter bunk. That's not what happened at all. Turns out Joseph Stalin was murdered by his chief of security, Lavrenti Berea. The deed took place at the Stalin Dasha, 10 miles outside of town. Uh, the murder weapon, uh, fittingly, was rat poison. Uh, it's a drug in the form of it's a blood thinner, warfarin that's used in moderate doses for a lot of us, but uh, poured into the wine drink after drink, drink will do you in, uh, that uh, Stalin took, uh, he lingered for three days in a terrible and most agonizing death. Once he was lying on the floor, Berea saw to it that no doctors were led in to help him. Uh, and then and if he wasn't points of poison, Stalin was certainly neglected to death. How do we know all that? Well, you got to go do the homework. You got to go, researchers have found the first autopsy report. Uh, you look at the memoirs of the people who were on duty that night. Listen to, uh, you look at the, the documents that Maria was sending to his associates in the nuclear weapons <coughs> program, which I've seen. Talk to Khrushchev's, you read Khrushchev's memoirs and talk to his son. All the pieces fit together if you do the homework. Uh, another, other views in that era uh, Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower, 
we all remember Dwight Eisenhower as the hero of World War II. He uh, came home, ran for president, was elected, ended the war in Korea, and then to my generation's perception, and I bet most of you, uh, he then started playing golf and not much else happened, which was just fine for me as a young officer in the Air Force. That's not true at all. Historians are now coming to appreciate that Dwight Eisenhower was one of the true geniuses of the Cold War. Dwight Eisenhower came to office with Korea raging. The war in Korea was perceived by many to be the opening gun in World War III. The bad guys were going to get us very busy in Asia, and then the Red Army was going to sweep across Europe. Eisenhower was presented with a budget from the outgoing administration that called for returning the United States to World War II footing, rebuilding the Army, the Navy, the Air Force. It was going to eat about a quarter of the gross domestic product. It was to get ready for World War III. Eisenhower had the courage and sense to say, no, that's not what we're going to do at all. We're going to rely on the new thermonuclear weapons to be a deterrent to the Soviet Union, to keep them from doing bad things. Beyond that, we'll spend 5% of GDP on defense for conventional weapons to be able to deal with brush fires. And beyond that, it is the economy of the United States, the free world, that will win this Cold War. He understood that that's what really won World War II, the arsenal of democracy. And he perceived that, that uh, the economic engine of the United States, along with the freedoms that we uh, wish to uh, keep preserved for our people, uh, would prevail over the Soviet Union's badly mismanaged economy. And of course, that's exactly the way it turned out. A lot of my generation, speaking of the Eisenhower years, remember one of the great political crises of the the last year of the Eisenhower administration, the U-2 shootdown. Francis Gary Powers was flying over Russia May 1st, 1960. Uh, he was shot down uh, over uh, Sverdlovsk, uh, and uh, there was a great political to-do about that. I was sitting in Moscow a few years ago doing research on this subject in one of the bars of the Better Hotels, a great dedication to my reading public. <laughs> and uh, I'm talking to a professor about this, and we were getting to know each other. Where are you from? I'm from San Francisco. He said he was from Sverdlovsk. Oh, I said, that's where my Air Force buddy Francis Powers came to Earth unintentionally. Oh, yes, he said, that's true. But he wasn't the only one. What do you mean? Well, he wasn't the only, he wasn't the only one shot down. What are you talking about? Didn't you know? And so he tells me the following story. As the U-2s, the U-2s have been flying over Russia since 1956. The Soviet Union could track them on radar, but they could not reach up to 70,000 feet to shoot them down. They were going more, and they were getting more and more paranoid about this. By 1960, every time a U-2 entered Soviet airspace, which was every two or three months, all civil aviation closed down, the Politburo met, uh, and the SAM, every SAM battery, every fighter base was told, if you see the U-2, shoot everything you've got. We've got to get that guy. May 1st, 1960, Powers takes off from Pakistan. He gets up to 70,000 feet over friendly territory, and then he enters Soviet airspace. Uh, he's at 70,000 feet. That's pretty high. SAMs generally can't reach that high. Uh, the other conventional aircraft can't get there. But the Soviet tactic was to assign a couple of MiG-19s to track him to fly at about 42,000 feet in case he lost power. Something else happened. If he began to lose altitude, they could get a shot. So he's chugging along through Russia, and he's taking pictures of all his neat stuff uh, until he gets to Chelyabinsk, to Chelyabinsk, which is near Sverdlovsk. Uh, and at Sverdlovsk, the Soviets, it turns out, have deployed a new SAM battery that our intelligence did not know about. And so he flies right over the middle of it. The SAM battery commander says, aha, there he is, fire everything, all buttons get pushed. Uh, they couldn't hit him because he was too high, but they came close, and the shockwave <coughs> blew off the tail. It's a very fragile airplane, and he spun down to earth and bailed out. He lived to tell about it. The pilots of the MiG-19s at 42,000 feet were not so lucky. It turns out the Soviets shot down their own guys. They were told to barrage every aircraft. They didn't care, friend or foe. And so these big 19s flying at 42,000 feet were sitting ducks. The Soviets shot down their own aircraft. Outside Moscow, there is a tombstone to Lieutenant Sergei Safranov, who was very dead, a victim of the Soviet Union, killing its own people in the Cold War. My informant says, you've got to understand, that's the way it is. 
you put on the uniform of the Red Army, and you're expendable. <coughs> we don't really understand the toll that the Soviet military machine took on the Soviet people, to say nothing even more of the nuclear program. The nuclear program was a disaster beyond comprehension. Example, Soviets manufacture plutonium at a place called Mayak, down at the south end of the Ural Mountains. You <coughs> manufacture plutonium by running a reactor, and then you take the reactor rods out, and put them in a bath of acid, and you do a lot of fancy chemical engineering, and pretty soon you end up with plutonium precipitating to the bottom of the tank. At Mayak, the Soviet had a couple of concrete tanks, but they weren't too good on calculating critical masses. And so one day in 1957, as both of these tanks fill, they go critical, and poly, they have a big time explosion. We're not talking Three Mile Island here. We're not talking Chernobyl. We're talking 10,000 Chernobyls. The numbers are 70 to 80 tons of radioactive debris that came right out of the guts of a reactor were blown downwind in the southern Soviet Union. A quarter of a million people had to be evacuated from 200 towns. And those who were not evacuated, their children and grandchildren to this day have all sorts of strange birth defects. And the thing is, it was 1957, before the days of satellites, before the days of much in the way of intelligence. In the United States, we never heard a thing. We never heard a thing until I and my peers are sitting around Moscow in the mid-90s, drinking vodka with our friends, and, the, and one fellow turned and said, you know, you need to know about the day we blew up my act. The, uh, the 50s and the 60s were dangerous times. We all remember Cuba, 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was a dicey time, but you have no comprehension of how dicey it was. In 1962, at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, we were fearful of missiles being brought in by freighters, but it turns out that on Cuba, the Russians already had 98 nuclear weapons, and even worse, the general in charge, General Pliev, had authority to use them. He had met with Khrushchev the summer before in July. Khrushchev said, here's the plan, here's what we're trying to do, you're in charge, stay in touch. But if you lose communication because you're at the end of this long shortwave uh, link, and uh, if you come under attack, use your judgment. In other words, if we had started bombing the airfields in Cuba, if we had started getting imaginative, there's no doubt in my mind that General Pliev would have responded with the nuclear weapons he had, at least aimed at the, uh, at the US fleet. Uh, he probably would have counterattacked the air bases in Florida that were being used to uh, uh, raid airfields in Cuba or if we were blowing up their rocket stands or whatever. Um, <clears throat> General LeMay, the commander of the Strategic Air Command, as many of you know, had a very poorly developed sense of humor. He would not have looked kindly on all this. Uh, and then undoubtedly the Cuba would have been radioactive ruins within four hours, and undoubtedly the fat would have been in the fire very big time. We are very lucky that the Kennedy brothers made deals offline with the Soviets, we'll trade you weapons in Turkey and we'll give Castro a free contact pass if you get this stuff out of here, don't bring them in. We avoided those nuclear 98 nukes coming into use by the most narrow of margins. We all remember, speaking of the 60s, the Gulf of Tonkin episode, August of 1964. August of 1964, two American destroyers, the Maddox and the Turner Joy, came under attack by North Vietnamese torpedo boats in the Gulf of Tonkin. And as a result of that, uh, the next day, on the 5th of August, 1964, uh, the United States Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution unanimously in the House and with only two dissenting votes in the Senate, which essentially became the basis of the, the legal basis of the war in Vietnam. Now that's a very interesting story, and everybody seems to know it. There's only one problem with that story. It never happened. How do we know that? We know that because it turns out uh, the pilot flying air cover for the Maddox and the Turner Joy uh, went on to become a hero in Vietnam the hard way a few years later. Jim Stockdale. At the time, Commander Stockdale was the carrier air group commander on the Ticonderoga. It was several miles in back of the Maddox and Turner Joy, but the night of the August 4th, the Maddox and Turner Joy radioed in that they were under attack, so they thought they'd seen something on their radar, perhaps waves, who knows. Um, 
Stockdale and the wingman took off from the Ticonderoga and went out to look. You could see that they could see the Maddox and the Turner Joy because their wakes were very luminescent. It was a dark night, but the wakes were very luminescent. But there were no torpedo boat wakes. So they went down to 500 feet. They went flew back and forth. Uh, they got water on their windshield. Uh, no torpedo boats. They really looked to find them because if they were there, they were the guys with the rockets that had to sink those boats and protect the destroyers. No torpedo boats. They go back to the Ticonderoga. <coughs> Stockdale lands with just barely enough time, enough fuel to land, no time for a go around. He lands, he goes to the communication shack, he sends a message to the military command center in the Pentagon. Maddox and Turner Joy not under attack. Don't do anything drastic until you look for debris in the morning and went to bed thinking, there, crisis averted. Wrong. Next day, the, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution was put on the floor of the House anyway, with total misrepresentations by SecDef Robert McNamara. It is clear now that the legal work, the wording of that resolution had been prepared as early as May. And so we were into Vietnam. Uh, I became Secretary of the Air Force at that time. I was very fortunate to have been tapped for that by Gerald Ford. He became President, and in the aftermath, all the chaos of Watergate and so forth, he brought in a, a new crew of people, uh, and to be there at that time was, uh, was an honor and yet was a challenge beyond words because it was the aftermath of Watergate. Uh, the war in Vietnam had, had wound down. <clears throat> and I, even at that time, did not understand how bad Vietnam had been. Uh, we all remember Vietnam, 50,000 casualties. We are used to, in terms of airplanes, however, we're used to when we, the United States, go to war against those countries over there, um, we lose a few dozen aircraft. We lost a few dozen aircraft in Iraq in 91. In the war in Korea, which went on for three years, the United States Air Force lost 139 aircraft. In Vietnam, the United States Air Force alone lost 2,257 aircraft. The Navy lost a similar number, a couple thousand aircraft. The Army lost thousands of helicopters. It was a disaster of unimagined size. And yet the interesting thing is that the Air Force that I knew and paid a lot of attention to also paid attention to learning the lessons. The main fault was the lack of political leadership, but on the ground, the Air Force learned we don't need to keep going back against hard targets like bridges over and over again. Uh, let's do something about using lasers for pointers. and Let's put television cameras in the front end. And so the, the first smart weapons were introduced uh, in Vietnam uh, as that war wound down. And the interesting thing uh, is the officer, the young captain that first flew against the Thanh Hoa Bridge with smart weapons uh, in the uh, early 70s is now the chief of staff of the U.S. Air Force, that the U.S. Air Force totally transitioned to the generation of smart weapons as a result. So the 70s unfolded. The 70s were a time when we looked at the Soviet Union as a monolith. By 1970, they had achieved nuclear superiority. Uh, the generally perceived wisdom is they were spending 16 or 17% of GDP uh, on defense, um, but that the, that the U.S. was, uh, was awash in shocks, the shocks of Watergate, the oil shocks, the oil price shocks. And the general wisdom of the 70s is, geez, the Soviet Union is really, they're big, they're tough, they're stable, too bad about their people, uh, but it's a dictatorship that is going to be here a long time. And uh, the previous administrations invented the concept of detente, which is we're going to do business with these guys in hopes that, that, that tie, business ties will stabilize things and we'll all get along. It was an interesting time, and interesting in writing this book, I went to talk to the presidents of that age, including President Ford. And I talked to other presidents or their national security advisors if the presidents were, were no longer with us. And uniformly, I, well, I asked the question, how did you, Mr. President, envision the Cold War ending? And uniformly, there was a lot of talk about history and this and that. But by the time of the third cup of coffee, everyone said, well, really, my objective was to get through my watch without this turning into a nuclear holocaust. The downside possibilities of nuclear disaster were so terrible that my objective was to try to be careful, don't make mistakes, and learn to live with the Soviet Union. But none of them, none of them had a vision, this is going to end one day, 
and this is how it's going to end. Their vision was we have containment, we have deterrence, it seems to work. Uh, large numbers of people are not getting killed. Uh, a lot of people aren't free, but this is stable. What happened in 1980 was a different mindset came to the White House. The election of 1980 brought a president who did not have a mindset of this is going to go on forever. He brought the mindset, Ronald Reagan, the mindset is the Cold War is going to end and I want to end it. And early, before the first convention, when asked, why are you running for president? He didn't talk about government's too big and all that. He said, I want to end the Cold War. And in response to the question, how do you plan to do that? I don't know, but we've got to end the Cold War. This cannot go on. And so he was elected president, and he brought that mindset with him. Uh, the, uh, in, in his new administration, his first year was focused on inflation and the economy. In his second year, he began to focus on national security, which is when Judge Clark and I joined him at the White House. Uh, and that we, we sat around uh, in the second or third week with his, as I said, peering over his glasses and saying, we've got this problem, what are we gonna do about the Soviet Union? The heroes of all that were the outside economists because this, the insiders uh, all said, you know, Soviet Union is stable, they're spending 17% the outsiders, fellow like Harry Rowan, who had been the president of Rand Corp, was then chairman of the Intelligence Councils, was of the view, no, if you do the accounting right, they're spending much more on defense than you think, because every road they build is several feet of concrete with rebar so they can move tanks anywhere they want. Every ferry boat in the Baltic is not just for carrying sheep and cows, it's big enough to carry tanks. And secondly, the economy is far smaller than you think it is and that the numbers really were, in Harry Rowan's views and mine and other backbenchers, no, the Soviets are spending about 50% of GDP on defense, which turns out to have been the truth. Uh, and so uh, the, the president asked us to uh, put together this plan for, so how are we gonna do about this? And so I was tasked to, to develop a roadmap that would in fact bring the Cold War to an end. And it's not a, this is not a tale of egomania because the Basically, assistant secretaries of state and defense and, and intelligence, so forth, all were part of the process. But it was an interesting plan because it was clearly and unambiguously was promulgated in a thing called National Security Decisions and Directive 32. It was a war plan. It is this is how we're going to take on the Soviet Union and beat them. It, the plan had five pieces. The first was economic. Uh, economic means uh, not economic warfare, but it means no credits. They want to buy wheat, fine. We'd be glad to sell you wheat, but please pay for it. Cash, no credit cards. And the Soviet Union did not have a bunch of cash. Uh, the second aspect of all this was military technology. And it was the building of B-1 bombers and Trident submarines, but it was also beginning to deploy all these smart weapons. It was satellite technology. It was the coming of SDI or Star Wars. All of those were to put pressure on a Soviet technological industry that was not advanced and in fact we now know was also corrupted with viruses and all sorts of problems that had gotten there due to our own good work, which is a whole other story. But military, in the military frame was to lean on them to make them compete or crash. The third piece was political. Political pressure. Now, political really is a polite word for covert action by the CIA or by other arms of the government. Now, that smacks of guys with cloaks and daggers and all sorts of stuff. That's not the way it works. Uh, you hear about the intelligence failures because they don't work and something goes wrong. You don't hear about the successes at all. Example, how many of you have any idea where the country name of Suriname is? Okay, one or two of you. It's one of those little countries in the upper right-hand corner of South America. Not many people live there. It's one of the leftover colonies from the Dutch and British and French. Suriname uh, was run by a dictator by the name of Bortesi in 1982. And we learned through various intelligence means that he has made a deal with the Soviets to build a Soviet embassy there. Uh, the Cubans are going to provide the troops to maintain order. Uh, the Libyans are going to operate all the electronic equipment that's going to be furnished by the Soviet Union. And Suriname is going to turn into another Cuba, a 
across the Caribbean uh, from Cuba so that the Soviets would have an anchor in Suriname and Cuba to really keep track of everything that's going on. We did not think this was a good idea. The Reagan White House, however, did not decide to go blow something up, uh, nor did we engage a bunch of guys with, with poison-tipped arrows. We did the following things. We went to the Pentagon and we said, please put together a war plan for invading Suriname, big time. And so, boy, that's what they do well. They plan these things. And after a week, they had all these charts. And the ships are in the Atlantic, and they're going to come in here. And the troops are in Panama, and they're going to paratroop in. And the Air Force is going to do this and that. They had all these view graphs, which were really very impressive. We didn't actually intend to go to war in, in Suriname, but we put the plan together. Then we sent word to the presidents of uh, Brazil and Venezuela, we would like to come just give you a heads up as to what we're getting ready to do. And so Bill Clark takes Air Force One and he flies, first of all, uh, to Caracas and meets at the end of a darkened runway with the president and the minister of defense of Venezuela, saying, just heads up, we're planning to invade Suriname. We can't have Soviet embassy down there. Thought you'd like to know what we're doing. And they just went crazy. Same thing in Brazil. They flew to Brasilia. They met with the president and the minister of defense. Uh, said, we're getting ready to invade Suriname, and it's a neighbor we just want you to know you're not going to be threatened, but you know, we can't have this happen. They went crazy. Both places, the president said, you Americans cannot do this. You come down here, you gringos, constantly invade places and send in the Marines, and you cannot do that. And then the president of the Brazil said the magic word, we'll take care of it. Ah. And so the Brazilians took care of it. Nobody got shot. The Brazilians went to see Mr. Bertese, a neighbor, and they explained to him how this would be a very poor idea. And with carrots and sticks, the carrots have all sorts of economic support for Suriname and threats to Mr. Bertese that his tenure would be very short if he fools around this way. And so Mr. Bertese went back to growing coffee in a gracious uh, senior years. And no Soviets were ever seen, and Bill Clark went home, and we never invaded, and nobody ever heard a word. That's what covert action is all about. If it works, you never hear about it. Diplomatic. The fourth leg of the <coughs> war plan was diplomatic. Diplomatic means working with your allies. It doesn't mean just passing a resolution somewhere. It means working with your allies. Uh, that's easy if their allies look like you and speak the same language, but one of our allies became Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan had been invaded by the Soviets in 1979. Uh, and that our enemy's enemy was our friend. Uh, and therefore, we decided to assist the Afghans in part with training, part with additional troops, which came from all sorts of terrible places, and with weapons. And eventually, we decided to equip them with Stinger missiles, which was used to essentially destroy uh, the Soviet helicopter fleet. Uh, and by the end of that uh, year, uh, the Soviets concluded that Afghanistan was their own Vietnam and they were going to withdraw. And they did. But in the process, Afghanistan became to the Soviet people what Vietnam had been to us. It was a terrible embarrassment uh, that the government did not know what it was doing. Now, the law of unintended consequences, we left behind all sorts of Stinger missiles and all sorts of warlords. We have to deal with that. But the point is, part of the plan was trust, work with our allies, people that have the same objectives we do to get the Soviets out of Afghanistan. And the last part of the war plan was information warfare. Information warfare means communicating with the Soviet people. Now, when the history of the Cold War is written, we have to give a special nod uh, to Mr. Uh, uh, Noyes and the gentleman at uh, Texas Instruments who together invented the microchip in 1978. And by 1980, the information age was beginning to blossom. By 81 and 82, it was clear that the Soviets no longer had a monopoly on the ability to communicate with their own people. And therefore, we decided we were going to seriously reorient the Voice of America to not just talk about the weather. Uh, we're going to talk about what's going on elsewhere in the Soviet Union, the scandals going on, Chernobyl, all this stuff. And we're going to talk to the Russian people. And of course, the ace in the hole was the great communicator himself. Ronald Reagan gave speeches at Westminster this whole war plan basically was announced in a speech in Westminster uh, in the summer of 82, where he talked about democracy. He gave the speech in Westminster as the, as the mother of parliaments, but he was talking to the Russian people. He gave the uh, 
uh, Evil Empire speech uh, later that year, uh, and the same thing. He was talking to the Russian people to say, we do not recognize your government as legitimate. It may be legally and diplomatically legitimate. We're not going to start shooting, but, but you people can recognize that we are not going to tolerate its unending existence. And what was really fun in writing this book was to start to talk to people who were 20 and 25 years old in 1982, uh, who were young enough to know the whole communist theory and so forth was a bunch of bunk. It didn't work, but they felt they were cursed with it forever. And then they heard the Westminster speech and the Evil Empire speech. And the interesting thing is, with the advent of technology and communications, the Evil Empire speech cut through the Iron Curtain like a hot knife through butter. Kids everywhere heard it and said, hooray, this system is on its last legs. And so it worked. Now, the, the thing is, uh, when putting together a war plan, when going to war, it's really a pretty good idea to think about how you're going to get back out again. Don't just start. Uh, and so it's really interesting to, to think about what, how we define victory. <coughs> Putting together this war plan, the definition of victory in the Cold War was not setting Berlin on fire. It was not tanks or the U.S. Army perched in Red Square. The definition of victory came right from the U.S. Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson wrote it. We wrote, and the thing that Reagan signed said, our objective is to force the Soviet government to seek the consent of the governed. Meaning, whatever it is you want, fine, when are you going to have some elections? And pretty soon, Boris Yeltsin is mayor of Moscow. And pretty soon, there's a Duma that really counts. And pretty soon, the whole thing starts to unravel. It basically worked. Because we didn't say we want to kick out the communists. We just said, we have faith in our system. We have faith in freedom. We just want you to have some elections that are real. And we want the people to have a voice in their government. The Soviet government had never been elected by anybody. They were illegitimate. Everybody knew that. And they would crash. And they did. And so it all came to an end. And, and the interesting thing about the end, the end essentially was with the coup in the summer of 91, August of 1991. Uh, many of us remember those days. Gorbachev is down in Crimea. Uh, he's under house arrest. Yeltsin's outside the Kremlin, outside the Duma, on top of a tank with a bullhorn. The Vice President Vyanayev is in the Kremlin holding a press conference looking very shaky, like he needed a drink, which he did. <laughs> and, and in Washington, we were sweating bullets, because the question is, which of these guys has the Cheget? The Cheget is the nuclear briefcase. It basically is a briefcase with a laptop inside, and it's how the head guy in the Soviet Union puts in the codes and directs the use of nuclear weapons, just as the US president is followed around with a, by a Marine with a black briefcase that lets him control US news. Our concern was, who has the Che Gat? Because maybe one, they're not going to take a shot at the US, but maybe one of these guys will fire off a nuke somewhere to prove that he's in charge and prove his manhood. And once one goes off, you just really never know what's going to happen, because nukes are pretty terrible things. And so we were really sweating bullets. It turns out we need not have worried. It turns out the Soviet general staff met during the August of 91, and they decided two things. One, the Americans are not going to do anything dumb at this time. They trusted us. Secondly, they did not trust these various contending members of the Politburo. And therefore, the Soviet general staff in the summer of August of 91 simply unplugged the nuclear forces of the Soviet Union. Can you imagine how many court martials would have followed if it hadn't worked? They simply unplugged the Cheget, everything else, and said, we'll just, if anything starts to happen, we'll talk about it, but we're going to unplug the nuclear forces, which they did. So it all came to an end. So what is the lessons to be learned from all this? Because we're entering a new era of conflict, it's very difficult. The Cold War is over, but it's not the end of history. So some lessons that occur to me. Number one, uh, an expression that came from our own revolutionary days. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. In other words, pay attention. That sounds good, but we don't do that very well. At the end of World War I, uh, the United States, the war was over. We said, whoopee, the war to end all wars is over. Bring the boys home. We had a hell of a party. It was called the Roaring Twenties. Uh, Germany lost the war. Tough luck. Have a nice day. 
uh, and those other guys with beards that took over in Leningrad, who are they, who cares? And that became, we became a very inward focused society, no concern about Germany, no concern about stuff overseas, not much concern about the technology that had stuck its head above the, the trenches, the, the coming of electronics and airplanes and so forth, until suddenly it's the 30s and there's Hitler and, and the fat is really in the fire. I think after the Cold War, we've done virtually the same thing. The Cold War is over in 91, whoopee, hooray, uh, new administration, let's bring the troops home, let's cash the peace dividend. Uh, Russia, smusha, who cares, you lost. No attention was paid. There was basically a few guys, professors went to give lectures, but there was no MacArthur-like American who said, we're here to help you. No one linked arms with Boris Yeltsin and said, you know, we want to help you on the road to democracy. And so they fumbled their way, and the Soviet Union was soon robbed blind by the robber barons. Nuclear weapons, industries, everything got out of control. We did not pay attention to the Soviet Union, nor did we pay attention to those other strange guys with beards. In this case, the people uh, down in Saudi Arabia who were forming all these schools, uh, uh, who in time would become the terrorists that haunt us today. So I don't think we've paid close attention, and as a result, we are now beginning to pay the serious prices, just as we did in 34. <clears throat> Second lesson from the Cold War, technology counts. That sounds like a Mother's Day resolution, but it isn't. Technology counts, uh, and that was very evident from, the, from our ability to prevail in the wars in Iraq. But the issue of technology counts becomes contentious when the, te when the technology really is new, and really is dangerous. Example, the coming of thermonuclear weapons. Once the Russians tested in 49, the US, Edward Teller said, we really need to have, proceed to the next step, thermonuclears. Big pieces of the American scientific community said, don't do that, you're setting a bad example, so forth, it won't work, so forth. Uh, and talking to the Russians later, they were all laughing and said, Americans don't proceed, they're either dumb or it's some trick, but they charged ahead as rapidly as they could. It was a very serious debate, and that had we not proceeded with thermonuclears, we probably would not have a submarine deterrent fleet and a lot of other uh, things that would be very destabilizing would be the case. Uh, the debates today are ballistic missile defense, uh, they are um, technology going to Mars. The trip to Mars is not about tourism, it's about technology. And that if we do not pay attention to technology, if we are willing to accept second place, the immediate consequences is the people who pay the price are the young GIs on the battlefield. But in the longer term, jobs will start leaving the United States in droves, and eventually the very sovereignty of the United States is at stake. Technology counts pay attention. Third lesson learned from the Cold War, the really the core issue is that the government must be the servant of the people, not the other way around. That was the real difference between the Soviet Union and ourselves. In the Soviet Union, the people exist for the convenience of the state. When the state gets the upper hand, then the gulags are sure to follow. And therefore, it is imperative that however we run our affairs, that we must bear in mind that, as Ronald Reagan put it, government is the problem, not the solution. Okay, that sounds simple enough. But now when you get involved in the war in terror, you have to begin to poach on the privacy of people. You end up with the Patriot Act, which a, which a lot of uh, Americans view as being a very dangerous encroachment on personal privacy. I have not no thought through view as to what to do about the Patriot Act. What I do have the view is whatever we do, we must bear in mind that you cannot let the government get the upper hand. It must remain as a servant of the people. Last lesson is that we still live at the edge of the nuclear abyss. That nuclear technology uh, is proliferating. There is no secret of the bomb anymore. You can look it up on the web. Uh, the issue is where do you get the nuclear materials? Where do you get the enriched uranium and plutonium? Uh, it turns out that in Russia, nuclear materials was produced like so much coal. I have confidence that the Red Army and the 12th directorate of the, of the Russian government knows where their nuclear weapons are. They all have serial numbers and they're great bureaucrats. But they produce plutonium and enriched uranium like coal. They just produced it. They didn't weigh it. And they don't have a big balance sheet. It just sort of got produced and went out the door and was shipped where some bureaucrat had said ship it to. But that fairly regularly, we now have friends call up and say, hey, we opened a barn that's secured by one padlock and we found 28 drums of 
funny stuff that sets off our Geiger counters, and we've been busy trying to rescue this. But there's all sorts of critical materials all over the Soviet <coughs> Union uh, that uh, it is very distinct possibility that some of that will, f will be fall into the hands or be bought by the bad guys uh, in one way or another get transported to the United States uh, and thereby cause some serious problems. Example, uh, New York, 1993. The first time the World Trade Center was attacked, you may recall, was with a Ryder truck. A bunch of bad guys uh, filled a Ryder truck full of ammonia, uh, fertilizer, parked in the basement of the World Trade Center, blew it up, killed six people and, and injured about a thousand. At Livermore, we went and looked and said, well, now supposing those guys also had 20 pounds of plutonium to put in the center of all that stuff. And supposing they didn't know anything about nuclear weapons other than what they get off the web. Well, whole truck full of explosive, 20 pounds of plutonium, you could probably get five kilotons. Good weapons designers could get 10 times that, but you know, Five kilotons, okay. Five kilotons is something you do not want to be anywhere near. We then ran the numbers. What does five kilotons at the World Trade Center mean? It means everybody south of Central Park dead. It means the radioactive fallout pattern uh, disabling most people stretches all the way up to Harlem in the north end of the island. It means the communications and financial core of the United States gone. That's just one possible terrorist shot. That is a very distinct possibility and requires a lot of attention. That we, uh, that we need to pay attention to all this because there are jihadists, there is a whole segment of radical Islam that is not just contesting over some island or how we run our banking system. They want to kill us all for reasons that have to do with our concept of our relation in, in the universe. So dealing with all this is going to cost money. Uh, it may cost personal liberties. Uh, it's going to require armed intervention overseas, which is not popular. Uh, but when you're talking about nuclear weapons, you really have got to take firm action because to temporize with people like North Korea, uh, you know, we could soon be in very serious difficulties. Uh, and lastly, it requires a better approach to intelligence. Uh, because it is getting out there. No longer do satellites work. I ran the satellite program for the U.S. and during the Cold War, it's great. You could get these pictures and listening posts and listen to everything, including Gorbachev's or at least Brezhnev's cell phone. But nowadays, you got to get in there with people who understand the community to really find out what is going on. So the Cold War ended. I think the heroes of the Cold War, as I wrote in this book. Uh, the heroes of the Cold War are the Cold Warriors on both sides because when it came to nuclear weapons, uh, the, the forces on both sides of the Cold War were loyal to their own people, their own governments. They fought the Cold War as they thought was right in the service of their own gods. But when it came to nuclear weapons, the people on both sides did what was right. And here we are. So thank you very much. Good to be with you. Thank you very much for a very entertaining and engaging, insightful discussion of the uh, Cold War and uh, the good guys and the bad guys in that. And uh, I think now we have an opportunity for people to ask questions. You should have received when you came into the auditorium cards such as Brian is holding over there. Uh, if you have a card, if you'd like to sketch out a question for Secretary Tom Reed, then uh, we can entertain it and then pass it to the ends and we'll collect the cards, your questions. Uh, while you're asking a question, writing a question down, uh, I'd like to ask you, I guess, the Good. first okay. the first question, uh, if you're game. Uh, I would just be curious, a um, couple of things, but you worked very carefully, very closely with Ronald Reagan. And uh, he had this bold vision to end the Cold War, which was a departure from many of his predecessors. What was it like to work with him? What were, what were some of his personal leadership uh, qualities, his style? Well, Ray, Ronald Reagan was a very interesting man, and, and like most presidents, he was not like the rest of us. Uh, the presidents are different. They have something that sets them apart. They have a sense of leadership. But to try to, to encapsulate uh, Reagan, first of all, he, he, he was old enough, you know, he was 70 years old when he became president. 
uh, and he had thought through what he believed in, and he basically believed in, you know, he believed in ten things: that, that uh, uh, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union is a bunch of uh, thugs and murderers, and they're hopelessly corrupt; uh, that government is the problem, not the solution; uh, that uh, do what's right; uh, that in any time to make a decision, forming a focus group and so forth is out of the question. He was a guy that basically had a sense of values and, and he knew what they were and once you knew what they are, you could work for him because given some particular crisis, you could tell where he was gonna come down because you could tell what the, uh, what the contending issues were. Uh, that he was um, 70 years old, uh, that uh, he was given a hard time about not getting to the office too early. I can sympathize with that. He, uh, he got to the office about nine and took a nap and he usually was out of there no later than five and at a press conference uh, and, and reporters ask of him, Mr. President, uh, are the taxpayers getting their money's worth for the salary they're paying you? You don't seem to get to work much. To which he responded as only he could. He said, well, I've heard it said that a hard day's work never hurt anyone, but I figure why take a chance? <laughs> why take a chance? Um, because he focused on what he did. He was the great communicator. He didn't run the White House. He didn't run a lot of other things. He paid attention to how am I going to communicate with the American people in the Soviet Union. Um, he was great to work for because he didn't change his mind and a decision was a decision. And once he put his OKRR on some decision paper, that's it. Don't think about going back and, and trying to re-argue the case. The most interesting and the thing that surprises people the most is his brain worked at a clock speed that was 10 times the rest of ours, not twice as fast. He had a brain that operated at a speed that you simply could not comprehend. That over and over, I would watch him at press conferences and, and a reporter would start, or in a debate, the opposing candidate would start. And after about three or four seconds, you could see his mind saying, click, this is the question about the Los Malones Dam. This is the question about experience in government. This is whatever question. And then he would start sorting these cards in his memory. Okay, we're gonna have this fact and that fact. And he would sort all that stuff, and then he would, you could see with sort of a smile, he, the closer, the sort of hook at the end that would make it a light touch, would go at the end. And after 25 seconds, the questioner would be through droning on and on, uh, and presto, out would come these staggeringly good responses. And that's why in in you know, press conferences and in presidential debates with Jimmy Carter, the, the comment about, well, there you go again. Uh, it was a line he had practiced over and over again. His debates uh, with Fritz Mondale uh, on the issue of, uh, you know, you're too old to be president, and he responds with, uh, I'm not gonna make the youth and inexperience of my opponent an issue in this campaign, brought collapse, not, not only from the audience, but from Mondale, who said, I give up. <laughs> um, that he had this ability and speed, even at his age, that was startling. He was really a, a very interesting man to work for. And uh, because he believed in right and wrong uh, and no focus groups, uh, he could focus on what needs to be doing, which made him very different. Very good. I think uh, along the same lines, here's a question. Uh, since you worked with several presidents, please share two or three of the best examples of leadership you witnessed. Best examples of leadership. Well, um, as I displayed with, with Reagan, uh, he, you know, he decided we got to end the Cold War, uh, and he told people to go figure out how we're going to do it. And once we figured that out, it was an iterative process. We didn't just put some paper in front of him. Uh, we debated it within the National Security Council, uh, but over and over again, he was the one that was decisive. That that the question when we were talking about the economics of the Soviet Union, uh, the issue uh, was, uh, you know, they're spending 50% of GDP in defense, is what the guys in the back row were saying. And so he, he said, you know, I think those guys are going broke and I think we can push them over backwards. And all the gray beards sitting around the cabinet table said, no, you can't do that. The Secretary of Defense said, no, we've got a stable relationship and they are the nuclear superpower. Secretary of State said, no, we've got all this detente treaties and the Secretary of Commerce said no because we're, you know, we want to sell them grain and all this stuff. And uh, the backbencher said uh, yes you can because uh, they are in fact spending 50% of GDP on the fence and they can't afford any more. And uh, 
did just with a smile and a nod to me, who was running the, the paper, he just basically said, yeah, we're going to push him over backwards. That's a very decisive thing to do when your <coughs> old cabinet says don't do it. Uh, that uh, uh, Ford, Gerald Ford was decisive, he did the right thing. That going from the Congress to the presidency is a, is a very rapid catapulting rise. And I suppose the greatest display of courage is also what may have been his undoing, which is the pardoning of President Nixon. Uh, it was clearly the right thing to do. Uh, that the, the messages were coming from the, from the Nixon daughters, that Nixon was highly depressed, uh, that he was considering suicide, uh, that, 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 the, that, the, that the opponents from Watergate wanted to keep hounding Nixon, put him on trial, send him to jail, and so forth and so on. Uh, and the president said, this country simply cannot have that. Now, those of us who, who, who think about it and afterwards think, you know, the way you do that is if you decide to do something really drastic, you co-opt everybody along the way. It would have been nice to have met with the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate and the grand old man of Washington and get everybody to agree this is what we should have done uh, and then issued the pardon. Um, but Gerald Ford wasn't cut from that cloth. It was right and wrong, as simple as that. And that he was a man who did, made decisions that what was based on right and wrong and that uh, being catapult from the from the Congress to the White House without ever having run from that office uh, didn't give him the tools of figuring out how to co-opt the whole system, but he had the basic tools of doing what's right, which is, which is something you don't often see. Um, Dwight Eisenhower, I did not know him personally. You know, I did meet him, uh, and I was uh, you know, around, and I've done the history. Um, clearly, Eisenhower, uh, very clearly, his military, I mean, he's a general officer. He was a military officer. All his buddies have said the Red Army is coming. We got to rebuild the World War II, and you know we got more have more guns and tanks and so forth. And he said, "Thank you very much, but that's not what we're going to do." And his farewell speech, which everybody remembers the phrase, warning about the military-industrial complex. He wasn't saying we got to burn down the Pentagon. What he meant by that expression is, be careful about all the lobbying from all the congressmen who've got defense plants in their district who want to build a few more tanks, a few more airplanes. No, no dice. We're going to spend 5 or 6% of GDP on defense, and that's it, and rely on nukes uh, to maintain the peace until uh, deterrence and, and containment play itself out. That was a very courageous thing to do, and Eisenhower knew how to do that. This next question gets at uh, who writes the history, and this person is curious why the textbooks continue to teach about the Tonkin Gulf Resolution uh, when the history is so wrong and people like Adam Stockdale have gotten that history right and have tried to tell it. Well, the writing of history and how it gets published, it's a free country and people write books about all sorts of things. And uh, who's got it right? You have to write it and make your case. Uh, and uh, I think that the Gulf of Tonkin the truth about the Gulf of Tonkin is now beginning to percolate through academic circles. Uh, and if you convened a, a seminar in Cold War history, you would find very few historians saying, no, the Gulf of Tonkin really happened. But Stockdale basically talked to people, a few people like myself have gone and done all the homework. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting tale. I mean, the whole injured innocence of our destroyers were fired on by the evil North Vietnamese. That's a total bunch of bunk also. We were running, the CIA had a separate war. We had these boats uh, that were they're fittingly called nasties. They were about 70 feet long. They had these huge diesel engines, 3,000 horsepower. They could do 45 knots. They had uh, howitzers on the front deck. They were going into shore every night, uh, blowing up radar stations and, and POL uh, stuff. And they were shooting up all the coastal shipping in, in North Vietnam. The North Vietnamese were entitled to be annoyed, I mean, they were doing other things, we were at war, but the point is to say that the destroyers were out there as innocent bystanders is simply not true because uh, the other arm of, uh, of our naval forces were running along the coast, shooting up the coastline all the time. So the North, it would be reasonable to expect the North Vietnamese were out there. But in case of the Tonkin Gulf, um, I think enough people write the stories uh, that if you convene a history conference. There are other pieces. Um, the death of Stalin, that sort of is not politically hot in this country, so people don't really care, but it's a matter of the people doing the homework. You just gotta do the homework. I guess if there are, you know, any of you youngsters are 
journalism students or researchers don't believe anybody. Your mother says the sun came up in the east this morning, check the weather channel. <laughs> don't believe anybody. Uh, in writing this book, I got to, uh, I had to clear it with all these places I'd worked, the White House, the Air Force, the Department of Energy, and so forth. The most helpful was the CIA, interestingly enough. The, uh, nobody said you can't say that. They basically said if some, some occasion, geez, don't use this guy's name, so forth. But the CIA was very helpful in saying, uh, fine, here's one name we wish you changed. By the way, you got the story in here, um, a tale by Philippe de Vaugely, a French spook, about how he borrowed an R5 rocket in transit through Poland and took it apart before the Russians knew it was missing. And um, that's a very interesting story, but we at the CIA don't happen to think it's true. You want a truth, you want to publish it, fine. But they were the ones that said, check it, because it was a story that was so good. I thought, you know, man, I'm going to run with this. And uh, so then I went and checked it, and it turns out that Mr. DeVogely, in his golden years, his mind sort of expanded as to what he'd achieved. <laughs> and the CIA pointed out to me that an R5 won't fit in a train anyway. And so it's over and over again, check it. So it has to do with how does history get written. You got to check it. The story of uh, Stalin, you just got to, there's a whole bunch of sources, and you go, look, how does it get written? A lot of people write all sorts of history, and it sort of, get sorted through and so you know I'm not really a historian. I'm doing the first draft and 20 years from now uh, the definitive stories we've written. This next question, was SDI essentially a bluff, a design to break the USSR financially? Uh, it was not a bluff and it was part of the design to, to break the uh, Soviet Union. Um, the interesting thing about the SDI and the reason Reagan stuck with it there's a whole story in this book and it's been attended with its release about how uh, the United States, basically uh, the Soviets were stealing technology. We learned what they were stealing and so we helped them and planted all sorts of other stuff and the things they were stealing. Namely, every time they basically illicitly acquired a chip or software or stuff like that, they had Trojan horses or viruses of various things. And so after a while, a chip would run fine for 10 million cycles and then start doing weird things. Software would run just fine, except it had a Trojan horse that says on Halloween, you know, do something else, such as uh, run a pressure test on the pipeline, which blew it up. The guys that did this, Casey and his associate Gus Weiss in the National Security Council, understood the end game. They had, they had a, they'd found an agent in the KGB who was leaking all this stuff. Sooner or later, he'll be caught. And then the Soviets will discover what's going on. Then they will be faced with the dilemma, the, the marvelous end game. Now, uh, they started stealing this stuff, and we started filling the, the software with junk in 82. By 85, uh, uh, the colonel is caught and talks. And now the Soviets realize their software is full of bugs and their chips are funny, and all the computers that they've gotten illicitly don't work. And now the question is, what does work? And so part of the game of SDI in talking to their general officers after the fact was their advice to, to Gorbachev is we cannot compete with SDI, and the reason we can't compete, A, it costs too much, but B, we don't have a technical base because our technical base is infested with bugs and viruses They've been put there for three years with stolen technology. And so therefore, SDI was, uh, it was came from three things. One, Reagan had a personal strong belief uh, that you should try to defend against incoming missiles. He was, had a horror of nuclear war. And so 10 are coming in. If you can only intercept one, you've saved a million American lives. Number two, SDI uh, would stress the Soviet economy. They couldn't do it. And number three, they knew they couldn't compete because their technology was full of bugs and they put there. Now we're starting to uh, ease toward uh, the current situation with this question and the next one. Do you see any similarity between the unpopular decisions that Ronald Reagan made to help end the Cold War and the unpopular decisions that Bush has been making uh, in the War on Terror in Iraq? I think they are, but unfortunately I'm a historian. I am I'm old enough to have decided to pay attention from 53, which was the arrival of Eisenhower, death of Stalin, coming of thermonuclears, 93, which was the, the close down of the evil empire. And uh, for the past six years, I padded around talking to Russians and so forth and so on. I paid attention to Iraq because the weapons that operated in 91 were those that I 
paid for the R&D and put in production in my watch. Um, the, the conduct of the war in Iraq, I have no idea. I have no comment because I really haven't paid attention. Um, the, the morals are that when you're talking about nations with nuclear weapons, you better pay attention. And it would be nice to have due process, but man, if you don't pay attention to North Korea, you'll be very sorry. Because five kilotons is not just another pop. That is a horror story beyond belief. Uh, that in the case of Iraq, uh, Iraq, uh, that Saddam clearly had nuclear ambitions. Uh, in the end of the 70s, he started to build a reactor with the assistance of the French. Uh, in 1981, the Israelis, who did not look kindly on this development, uh, went over a few weeks before it was about to go critical and blew it up. It was called the Assyric Reactor, and they raided it with uh, a dozen F-16 aircraft and destroyed it. Saddam figured out, okay, the problem with going the plutonium route is you have to build reactors which are visible. So he proceeded down the enriched uranium route. Uh, and he, he had a lot of small pieces of things that were making enriched uranium, which we never guessed about. But when we went in there and inspected after the 91 war, lo and behold, here's all this equipment making enriched uranium. Once again, it was all destroyed. Uh, uh, that Saddam clearly told his, his new, and we found all the documents and the design and the program and so forth. He told his uh, staff uh, to, you know, get on with the program anyway. Uh, there's a most interesting book uh, written by a Iranian uh, Iraqi, named approximately Oveda, called The Bomb in My Garden. And it's about how all the files and all the hardware were buried in the various nuclear scientists' garden until they could be safely brought out again. I think that the, um, the nuclear weapons of mass destruction went to Syria, uh, that, that, that Saddam clearly has nuclear um, ambitions, and when that happens, you've got to deal with it. I think we should have dealt with North Korea's reactor uh, in 1995, uh, 94. Bill Perry, SecDef, had a plan to do that, and the White House would not let him do it. Um, that you just you simply cannot temporize when you're talking about nuclear weapons. So to the extent of should we have gone into Iraq, I think so. Uh, how we have conducted the war, I don't, I don't know. Just two more questions, uh, more on a personal note. The first of the two, uh, you had a very interesting career at Lawrence Livermore. Uh, what made you turn to politics, uh, get interested in politics? Well, that's interesting and simple. I had been in the Air Force. A buddy of mine got killed in a war allegedly wasn't going on, but he was very dead. Uh, he was Vietnam. I was a, I'm a, I'm a part of the Vietnam protest movement, uh, but that I concluded that going out and demonstrating in the streets is not going to get rid of Lyndon Johnson. My views were in 1964. Uh, Lyndon Johnson is lying. Robert McNamara uh, is an evil force. Those are pretty strong words to use in such an academic forum, but it happened to be the way I feel. Uh, and so uh, I concluded that, uh, you know, you, you elect Lyndon Johnson in his own right in 64, man, we'll be into Vietnam up to our hips before you can say Shazam. And sure enough, April of 65, all these Marines are going ashore. And my view was this is not a good idea. Tonkin Gulf didn't smell right to me at the time. And so I concluded this guy is bad for the country. And we've got to get rid of him. And uh, who are we going to run against him? And my view is demonstrating in the streets doesn't get rid of him. You've got, you got a constitution that tells you how to do that. So we've got to get rid of him constitutionally. We've got to have a candidate. My view that was that Ronald Reagan was, a, was, was articulate as a terrible understatement, was a true political genius. And so I volunteered to go work for him uh, in 1965 as Vietnam began to wind up. Uh, and uh, got him was instrumental in his getting elected governor. And then I, I ran the abortive attempt to win the nomination for him in 1968 because everybody knew that Richard Nixon couldn't ever win anything. Well, of course, shows how much I knew. Uh, but in fact, uh, uh, I got involved with Reagan because of Vietnam. And once involved, uh, it became clear to me that, that really I had a, a trusteeship because he trusted me and I understood him and I knew how to run his campaigns on at least two occasions unequivocally, I saved his political life, uh, and that I really felt for the ensuing decades that uh, I had a responsibility because, because he had a rendezvous with destiny. But it was started with Vietnam, and I could have come, easily become part of the SDS, except they didn't really have an orderly plan for how you get Lyndon Johnson. Last question, do you have another book in you? 
aren't you kind to ask? <laughs> of course. You know, again, for you students who are going to be journalists or writers, writing your first book is, is a true horror story. And you can write it, uh, but I can tell, you know, publishers, hi, I'm a retired businessman that used to work in the government, and I've written a book, clack. Uh, <laughs> and you, you have to have an agent, and you have to have an agent that believes in you. You have to have somebody to open the doors. Getting this book published was a long and arduous process. Uh, too long to take here this evening, but the net result it published. It did very well. Random House published it. Once it does well, then you are no longer a peasant. You're now property. And therefore, now they start talking about, gee, we need another one, and so forth. Uh, I am outlining. I haven't committed myself to do it yet, but I think it's terribly important. Terribly important to all of you. It has a working title, From Trinity to Tehran, An Insider's History of Nuclear Terror. And it is the history of the proliferation of nuclear weapons, starting with the first, Trinity was the first shot in the New Mexico desert, uh, proceeding through to Tehran, because I think, more than think, I'm willing to bet anyone wants to come up with real money, that one of the following three things is going to happen in the summer of, 90, of uh, 2005. One, the Soviet Union is going to, Russia is going to resume nuclear testing on the island of Novaya Zemlya. They simply, their, their conventional military forces have deteriorated. Uh, they see openings for new technology and nuclear weapons, and they're going to go for it, and we're going to see a resumption of Soviet testing, which will be an enormous flap. Uh, number two, and, or, the North Koreans are going to shoot. If I had to bet, I bet they're going to shoot in the next week or two so as to stick it right in George Bush's eye. Um, but whether they do it then, uh, Bill Perry, who was Bill Clinton's sec def and a very good guy, uh, is also willing to bet on the same thing. The North Koreans are going to shoot, and that is going to have enormous repercussions because the Japanese and the Taiwanese and everybody in that neighborhood is not going to stand idly by uh, when the North Koreans have nuclear weapons. And, and that is really bad because I do not want to see Taiwan developing nukes. I do not, you know, Japan, man, they could have, they could have nuclear weapons in two weeks. Sony would have a model out there just boom like that. <laughs> and so, I think the North Koreans are going to shoot. And thirdly, in Iran, either the Israeli government is going to take out the Iranian nuclear capability, which would be a great flap to go in and bomb stuff in Tehran, or the Iranians are going to test to establish that they are members of the nuclear club. And then I think we need to talk about how did the technology come to proliferate? Because it started out with America, Russia, England, and we were sort of provincial and then we get to the 60s and 70s where India and Pakistan uh, and China begin to test and deploy things. But the interesting thing is that the Pakistanis uh, were the enemies of the Indians. The Indians shot in 74. The Chinese said, my enemy's enemy is my friend. Uh, therefore, I'm going to help. And so the Chinese gave the Pakistanis a nuclear design. And they told them how to build the centrifuges to get the uranium. <coughs> They entrusted this technology to Mr. A.Q. Khan, who in turn began to operate a nuclear Walmart and sold the technology to Libya, North Korea, Iran, and so forth. It is the spread of that nuclear crabgrass that now really poses some serious problems. I know a lot about it, whether I have the energy to write it, we shall see, but you're very kind to ask. And uh, in any case, if you want the, the uh, current book, it's outside, and I'd be glad to sit and write until my fingers come off if any of you want me to sign them or anything else. It is uh, joyous beyond words to be here because you're a great bunch and this is a really great library. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for a very entertaining and enlightening uh, evening. And uh, just a, a note for you all who are here, we've got the punch and the cookies outside, but also, more importantly, uh, <laughs> There are copies of the uh, book, and uh, we hope that uh, you'll be able to pick up a copy. Uh, as you know, Tom Reed will sign it for you and personalize it. Thank you very much. Have a safe drive home. Thank you.